this week, we've actually got a lot to cover because I missed last week and I'm a couple days late on this previous weekend's episode. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I was at uh, the Northeastern or Tri-State area, depending on how you want to call it, uh, Fall Fest. And if you want to know how I did, uh, let's just say front triggers are a bitch and leave it at that. <laughs> God. Anyways, so uh, we have two episodes to talk about, and I kind of find interesting these two episodes go a little hand in hand, which I quite appreciated. In last week's episode, we get a big set of flashbacks from Kai's perspective. This is interesting because Kai's perspective on previous Ren is kind of like his current perspective on Aichi. He views Aichi as just sort of this innocent, happy-go-lucky good guy who's just kind of making everyone lives better, and that's kind of how he viewed Ren. Okay, maybe not that la last part. But he thought of Ren as this sort of happy-go-lucky kid who just happened to have, like, a rough past, and we see how that kind of went badly. And what I like about this is that they do try to set up how our hero and our villain are similar, but they also highlight the differences without going too deeply into it. When Ren walks into the card shop and Tetsu just says, your dad hit you again, that's really the end of it. There's, like, I guess the one point where Kai goes, like, his dad's not very good, but... They don't really need to go into it. For better or for worse, everyone watching this is going to understand the implications of that. They're going to understand what having an abusive parent could do to a child. Or at the very least, if they don't know a lot about it, they can at least sort of infer the fear of it. Maybe even some kids will unfortunately relate to it and can very much sympathize and empathize with Ren. This is very good, and it allows you, the viewer, to come to the conclusions you want. So it kind of seems reasonable reasonable when he finally feels some strength and power in life when his psychoalia takes hold that he really gets into it. It's the first time he's felt strong in his life and like he has control over something. So he really just sort of lets it consume him. Remind you of a certain blue haired boy we've been seeing recently as he's kind of liked getting into the role of tougher card fights and then getting into it and hearing voices in his head. Moving on, let's talk about that for a minute. I love how no one's like, Ren is clearly a frickin' lunatic. And I love when Suiko shows up, no introduction, just sort of is walking along, stops and talks to these two kids, and is like, you're hearing voices in your head, aren't ya? They're probably telling you to wear that weird skirt thing, aren't you, ginger boy? And Ren's just like, yes, I will believe you, stranger on the street. I'd love to see the New York City version of this scene where it's just like a homeless person, and then he takes Ren around and stabs him and steals his wallet. <laughs> That's how that scene goes in real life. Uh, but then Suiko gives us the name Psychoalia, just sort of abruptly throws it in, which works in a flashback, where for Kai, he's remembering this almost very nightmarishly as his life and sort of the only stability he started developing in his life Life really kind of became unraveled thanks to Psychoalia. I also like that Psychoalia is said by someone who up, who only thinking of the vacuum of this series we have no reason to believe isn't some lunatic on the street, because Psychoalia sounds like some random weird name someone thought last minute. Um, moving on, we then sort of... I won't really talk about the other flashbacks in the episode. They felt very much like they were just a sort of kind of... Uh, fill in time like they came up with the concept of the Ren re revelation scenes and then they just kind of needed to pat us out to 25 minutes is it great no but unlike Yu-Gi-Oh! Varane's this doesn't feel like it's going to become the norm uh moving on then to this week's episode whose big sort of focus was interestingly enough kind of showing the same thing but from a different perspective, and that being the perspective of someone older and someone in a much more of a clear mind state than Kai is often shown off to be. Tetsu had a very different reaction when Ren started going through Psychoalia. Instead of being almost scared away like Kai was, Tetsu wanted to help him. Tetsu saw that Ren was finally feeling some power in his life, and instead of being turned away, he kind of wanted to just sort of let it be and let it go and even sort of help it grow. Not because he's insane or because he's evil, but just because here's this kid who Tetsu can't really help otherwise finally maybe getting some closure or getting some level of growth, so Tetsu did what he thought was right and tried to help it, 
and then by the time Ren became too powerful and too crazy, it was already too late. This is actually really neat, and I liked it, and I liked that it showed that Tetsu saw Ren for his suffering, not for the lunatic he was becoming. Unfortunately, it kind of loses me a bit with the next couple parts. First up, I like that when we see Tetsu reveal the VF gloves, it's clearly not supposed to be legal. <laughs> like, this isn't really a thing. Also, it was shown in the most evil place that Asian people know, a sweatshop. That is great cultural world building. Uh, anyways, what I liked about this in theory is the concept. It's not saying that Tetsu was doing the right thing. Obviously, making a glove to electrocute people is fucking insane and ridiculous. That's good, but the issue I'm having with the whole thing is that then Tetsu, like, got other people to wear this and, like, gets them to hurt themselves, and then he, like, sends everyone onto the streets to, like, get other people involved and do all this card fighting stuff all to save Ren. The problem here is they clearly want you to sympathize with Tetsu, and I don't. <laughs> like, I genuinely don't, and I want to because I like the concept. But the problem is the execution. You want me to now sympathize with a guy who is torturing people and then sending those tortured, now brainwashed lunatics out to torture and brainwash more people into believing into an ideology you don't actually believe, but an ideology you're using to help someone else who's clearly in La La Land. This is ridiculous. I was assuming, because I haven't read the manga, and at this point I really don't, I don't want spoilers, um, the, what I was thinking was going to happen was it turned out the VF gloves were made by Ren's father. Maybe Ren's father is the actual villain. But the thing is, no, it's trying to keep it more self-contained, which is nice. But when you make it, it's a character we're later going to have to sympathize with. It doesn't really work. And you know they're going to make you try and sympathize with Tetsu. On top of that, I don't believe for five seconds that so many people would agree to basically put their lives in danger. Being electrocuted isn't like someone throwing a bucket of water on you. Being electrocuted is legitimately dangerous. Like, seriously, how has no one died from this yet? It was one thing with Asuka, because Asuka is in love with Ren, maybe even to a certain dangerous extent. So because of this, when she thought this was her way to get closer to him, when simply just card fighting him wouldn't do, that I can kind of see... But you expect me to believe that everyone else is willing to do this because of the getting better at Vanguard? And before anyone says, oh, Kevin, like, they do crazy stuff like this in Yu-Gi-Oh! Or they did stuff like this in Card Fight Vanguard G! Or why do you have to question it? It's just a goofy card game anime. My problem is it's not goofy. Like, everything up till now is being played straight and as close to the real world as possible. And then you just get this big sort of convoluted nonsense. And it just kind of doesn't fit to me. I know you need escalation. I know you need stakes. I don't think this is necessarily the right way to do it. And using the other two as examples, Yu-Gi-Oh! is set in a much more fantastical, silly universe. Like, th that is the kind of universe where people would do things like electrocute themselves to card games. Remember, someone snuck onto an island, brought a gun, and trapped four teenagers into behind a rock so that way he could get a rematch against the guy who, who beat him in a card game. And remember, we call that guy the greatest American in anime. So, um... So yeah, that's there. And also if we're going to use Cardfight Vanguard G, I don't like Cardfight Vanguard G. It was very bland and uninteresting. But one thing I thought was sort of a neat idea when they did the whole concept of people basically torturing themselves to get stronger. First up, no one was really at the point where they put the life on the line. When, like, um, what's-his-face, Shion got electrocuted in a card fight, it was sort of insinuated this wasn't what was normally going on and was only for the people who were borderline crazy. That was that. And also, on top of that, none of the things these people did were necessarily torturous or even necessarily bad. The problem was, was that they were pushing themselves in a way that was dangerous for them psychologically and also was bad because they aren't enjoying Vanguard at that point. They're using it as a way to feel powerful in life. That is more or less the moral conundrum going on. Rather you think it's good or not is different. On top of that, when it came time for the villain Kanzaki 
to basically be revealed as the evil lunatic doing all this. They didn't want you to sympathize with them. They didn't try to humanize him. He was a monster. He was hurting children, and he wanted it for a selfish, ridiculous goal. And the show played that up. Again, it's not done well, but for what it is, I believe it. This just pushes things a little too far. Now, I liked how they brought it back, and they showed that Aichi, who is sort of developing his psychology, maybe showing off darker sides of his personality, does sort of see it for a minute, the advantage of this. This is great, so long as the show doesn't try and play up that there is some legitimacy to what Tetsu did. I don't think it will, but, you know, sometimes with these anime they do like to make the message, well, whatever it takes to win. And let's be real here, that is definitely a problem in anime, predominantly sports anime. Don't go down this road, Hanebato. I love you too much. For those of you who don't know, Hanebato is also an anime that features a cute skinny kid with very creepy eyes. Like, seriously. Ugh. Anyways, so that was this episode, these two episodes. I do like it. I The show hasn't lost me. I'm just saying I'm... St this is kind of getting a little ridiculous, in my opinion. Uh, but what do you think? In the comment section below, give me your thoughts on all this, and if you thought the gloves are okay, or whatever. And as for this week's Vanguard Question of the Weeks, me beautiful gold paladins are coming out. For those of you who don't know, gold paladins are my favorite clan. Expect a video when Ezilg finally gets revealed, because i got to talk about that shit. Um, what do you guys think of the gold paladins? A lot of people are getting really hyped, but I have been seeing some opinions of, well, if everything involves soul blast costs, gold paladins have a bad history of running through their resources too quickly. Could we see that repeated, or will there be proper ways to rebuild the soul, or will gold paladins be like they were in G-Era, essentially just a big glass cannon deck? Tell me what you think about that below, and as always, click to like and click subscribe. Ah!